Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I call to order the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Readiness. I'd like to welcome everyone to this morning's hearing and would like to thank our panel of witnesses for being here today to discuss the Defense Organic Industrial Base and the significant role it has in maintaining and restoring readiness back to our armed services. This hearing will specifically focus on the current state of the United States Navy and the United States Air Force depot policy issues and infrastructure concerns. Our shipyards, fleet readiness centers, and air logistics complexes are critical in America's ability to project power and to properly train and equip our warfighters. The sustainment industrial base provides the backbone for the military to respond to a variety of contingencies, surge capacity, and provide unique solutions to requirements. Our readiness recovery is fragile, and it is important to understand exactly what is in jeopardy. During this hearing, I would like for you to help answer the basic question. In the terms of risk, what is it, does it mean to our national security, particularly our sustainment industrial base, to have ships moored to the pier or sitting in the dry dock for extended periods of time, or have aircraft waiting for depot maintenance? The depots saw diminished workloads when major combat operations ended in Iraq and Afghanistan. This decreased workload, coupled with the unpredictable budgets and continuing resolutions, forced the services to divest a portion of the technically skilled workforce and limit reinvestment in depot facilities. We know these variables have significant effects on the people, depot rates, and long-term organic industrial base viability. We are particularly interested in your infrastructure concerns and propose solutions. Other common issues I am aware of across military depots relate to the carryover, infrastructure strategic planning, and civilian hiring. We want to hear what the issues are from your perspective and how they're impacting your mission. It is our responsibility as members of this subcommittee to understand the readiness challenges of our armed services and how the resources and authorities provided impact capabilities this nation needs. Before I introduce the witnesses, I turn to the ranking member, Congresswoman Madeleine Badayo, the distinguished gentlelady from Guam, for opening comments she would like to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I thank all of our witnesses for being here this morning. I think that we all agree that when the American public thinks of the term national defense, they envision our proud service members stationed around the world and the equipment, the ships, tanks, and aircraft that we supply so they can carry out their missions. What is not often thought of are the capabilities needed to maintain these assets, especially the depots and shipyards of the organic industrial base that play a critical role in the readiness of our military forces. Without properly maintained ships, submarines, aircraft, and weapon systems, our forces cannot perform necessary training required to build readiness or meet the operational requirements that are placed upon them. So I am concerned that in a year where readiness has been cited as the department's top priority, the department's budget request only supports 93% of the Air Force depot maintenance requirements and 92% of the Navy's aviation depot maintenance requirement. When questioned about why these accounts were not funded to 100% of the requirement, the department stated that the accounts were funded to the maximum executable rate. Thus far, no analysis has been shared with the committee on how the maximum executable rate was calculated or what the limiting factors are to increasing execution rates. I have long stated that just as important as it is to provide our service members with new, updated equipment, we must fully maintain the assets that we already have. And I hope that our witnesses can share their perspectives on this issue today. Your workforce is the backbone of your depot operations. This diverse assembly of people possess invaluable skills and expertise that must be cultivated, taking years of schooling and experience to acquire. Keeping a workforce of such caliber requires constant effort to hire, train, and retain. Past NDAA provisions have granted additional authorities allowing depots to expedite hiring, and I look forward to hearing if these provisions are sufficient or whether additional changes are necessary. 
I also hope that the witnesses will provide their perspective on the continued need and support provided by non-DOD shipyards and depots, especially with growing requirements and deferred maintenance backlogs. Without our shipyards and depots, our ability to ensure the safety of our nation and pursue our national interests are severely impacted. Gentlemen, your shipyards and depots must accomplish their missions. If we are going to rebuild readiness, we need to ensure that the depot maintenance accounts are fully funded to meet the requirement. If there are policies, authorities, workforce, in infrastructure, or other challenges that are impediments to increasing the execution rates of the depots, this subcommittee needs to hear about them. So I, today, or this morning, look forward to hearing your testimony on the challenges that our shipyards and depots are experiencing in personnel, operations, and infrastructure management, and how this committee can help you address them. So thank you, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And thank you very much, Congressman Badayo. Uh, we're grateful to recognize the witnesses here today. We thank them for taking the time to be with us. Welcome. Vice Admiral Thomas Moore, Commander, Naval Sea Systems Command, U.S. Navy. Ad Vice Admiral Dean Peters, Commander, Naval Air Systems Command, U.S. Navy. And Lieutenant General Lee Levy, Commander, Air Force Sustainment Center, U.S. Air Force. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our witnesses that your written statements have been submitted for the record and ask that you summarize your comments to five minutes or less. As a reminder to our members, we will adhere to the five-minute rule for questions by our witnesses, and it will be ably um, controlled by uh, our professional staff member, Drew Warren. Uh, at this time, we would proceed uh, with uh, General Levy. Good morning. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordayo, distinguished members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify along with my joint partners on the readiness of your United States Air Force. It's a real privilege. On behalf of our Secretary, the Honorable Heather Wilson, and our Chief of Staff, General Dave Goldfein, thanks for your support and demonstrated commitment to our airmen, our Air Force civilians, families, and veterans, particularly on this Flag Day. Without pause, your United States Air Force continues to deliver global vigilance, reach, and power for our nation. We're always in demand, and we're always there. We've supported joint and coalition forces throughout every operation, and we've secured our homeland through continuous surveillance and air defense and nuclear deterrence. We've been in nonstop combat, your Air Force, for 27 years. We've done all this with a force that's 30 percent smaller than at the outset of Desert Storm and with aircraft and infrastructure that continues to age and present new challenges. But the 43,000 total force airmen of the Air Force Sustainment Center, active duty, National Guard, reserve, and civil servants operating from 74 locations across the globe are amazing. And they continue to seek new and innovative ways to get the job done. Make no mistake, your United States Air Force is ready to fight tonight. But I'm concerned about our ability to sustain our Air Force to fight tomorrow. Threats to the nation and our vital national interests continue to evolve, adapt, and present formidable, formidable challenges that threaten us and our allies. We've returned to an era of great power conflict. That competition challenges our security and prosperity. As we develop advanced air, space, and cyber capabilities for tomorrow, we must continue to adapt our readiness, sustainment, and logistics enterprises as well. The organic industrial base, simply put, is the nation's insurance policy. It underpins our readiness to fight not only tonight, but be, to be prepared to fight and sustain into the future. The Air Force Sustainment Center underwrites this for our Air Force, our joint partners, and allies. Our command has responsibility for nuclear sustainment and supply chain management for two-thirds of the nation's strategic nuclear triad. Nuclear deterrence operations are the bedrock of our national security. We operate a global logistics and sustainment network, a global supply chain, three air logistics complexes, air power factories, if you will. Our command also has responsibility to set, open, and sustain theaters in time of peace and conflict with weapon systems that are on average approximately 28 years old. In short, we are a $16 billion a year joint interagency and coalition readiness engine. The defense industrial base is brittle. We find an ever-diminishing vendor base for sustaining our platforms, 
The workforce underpinning the industrial base is also brittle, and we face increasing challenges recruiting the kind of talent our force simply must have for the future. A fifth-generation Air Force must have a fifth-generation workforce. I could go on and talk about this at length, and I look forward to your questions. But again, it's a real honor and a privilege to be with you, and I yield my time back. Thank you. And thank you very much, General. We now proceed to Admiral Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Bordayo, uh, distinguished members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today to discuss Navy readiness and, in particular, readiness in our depots. Before I begin, I would like to thank the Congress for your support of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 and the Fiscal Year 2018 Consolidated Appropriations Act. This legislation provides the predictability and stability in funding and allows us to continue the work we started in fiscal year 2017 to restore the Navy's organic industrial base. At any given time, the Naval Sea Systems Command has under its care approximately one-third of the battle force as they undergo maintenance and modernization. For that reason, NAVC's number one priority remains the on-time delivery of ships and submarines to the fleet from both new construction and maintenance availabilities. NAVC is executing a number of initiatives to improve its on-time performance, starting with growing our organic workforce. Between the beginning of FY 2013 and, and today, the four naval shipyards have hired 21,000 people and are on a path to reaching our goal of having 36,100 full-time shipyard employees by the end of fiscal year 2019. The growing and better trained workforce is beginning to have a positive impact. In 2017, all four aircraft carrier availabilities were completed on time, and we significantly reduced the delays in delivery of our submarine force. That trend continues in 2018. More work remains, but we are on the right track. Prior year capacity limitations and the overall priority of work towards our ballistic missile submarines and aircraft carriers resulted in our attack submarines absor absorbing much of the delays causing several submarine maintenance availabilities that were originally scheduled to last between 22 and 25 months to require 45 months or more to complete. This situation reached a boiling point in the summer of 2016 when because of a lack of capacity in our public shipyards, the Navy decided to defer the scheduled maintenance availability of USS Boise that will take it offline until 2020. Ultimately, Boise's availability was contracted to the private sector and will begin in January 2019. Going forward, the Navy will take a longer-term view as we consider the private sector for future maintenance work during peak workload periods as both relief to our naval shipyards and to ensure we maintain the health and proficiency of the private sector nuclear industrial base. People alone will not provide the throughput and productivity needed to meet the maintenance and readiness requirements of today. As outlined in our recent report to Congress on the Naval Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Plan, we must also make substantial investments in our four nuclear-capable shipyards to ensure we have 21st century shipyards ready for the challenges of a maintaining a growing fleet. This 20-year plan includes repairing and upgrading our public shipyard dry docks to accommodate future Virginia-class payload module submarines and new four-class carriers, recapitalizes the equipment to replace aging equipment with up-to-date technology, and optimizes the layout of the shipyards by moving and upgrading facilities closer to actual work. We look forward to working with Congress in the execution of this plan. The challenges facing our private sector non-nuclear surface ship repair base are similar to those seen in our naval shipyards, with the private sector also facing capacity and workload challenges they need to make and the need to make investments to upgrade facilities, equipment, and dry dock. The lack of stable and predictable budgets over the past 10 years has had an even bigger impact on our private sector ship repair facilities and is a core reason why the capacity of our private sector today is about 75 percent of our workload requirements, with the net result being the late delivery of our ships from maintenance availabilities. The Navy is committed to working collaboratively with industry to provide them a stable and predictable workload in a competitive environment moving forward so they can also hire the workforce and make the investments necessary to maintain and modernize a growing non-nuclear fleet. We are as dependent on their capabilities and capacity as we are on the public depots. As we build the 355 ship Navy, we must have the maintenance capacity and infrastructure needed to ensure our growing fleet is maintained and modernized on time and on budget to deliver forward deployed combat ready ships. Our ongoing efforts to hire more people and invest in our naval shipyards combined with the Navy's continuous dialogue with industry lays the foundation required to maintain today's force while also looking to the future. We have challenges ahead, but we are on an improving trend and that will ensure we have the capacity today and into the future to maintain and monetize our Navy. I look forward to your questions, and I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Admiral Moore. We now proceed to Admiral Peters. Uh, good morning, uh, 
Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordayo, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be appear before you and discuss naval aviation readiness and the health of our organic industrial base. Although I've only been on the job two weeks, I was actually pleased to see this hearing on the schedule because NAVAIR Industrial Workforce, our civilian sail sailors, and our infrastructure are my top priority for focus and attention. In conjunction with the Air Boss, Vice Admiral Miller, and the Deputy Commandant for Aviation, Lieutenant General Rudder, we are aggressively stabilizing naval aviation readiness for the present and starting to put in place long-term strategies for lasting health and improvement. In regard to the current status, we are making definite progress, but there's still a long way to go. One of the most critical components of readiness, as has been mentioned, is our organic maintenance repair capability. Uh, it, that's both our intermediate level maintenance and our depot level maintenance. The depot industrial base, which we call fleet readiness centers, uh, is critical to our overall health and wholeness. I am pleased to report on fiscal year 2017. For the first time in over five years, our FRCs were largely able to meet the fleet demand for production of aircraft and engines. We produced 485 of 487 expected aircraft, including 69 F-18 A through D, and we delivered more than the required number of F-18 E and F. This was done while also improving the turnaround time by 5%, which you can imagine is critical to being able to produce those numbers. Over the last two years, we've also been able to reduce the backlog of aircraft that need in-service depot level repairs. These are the repairs that are done at the field. And this was reduced by about 25%, which means that we put more aircraft back into the hands of the warfighters. The improved performance in these two areas are the good news. And we've got to keep this production going. The not so good news is that our FRCs are not performing as needed in the area of component repair and overhaul which is about 20% of our FRC workload and includes over 50,000 parts. To date, in fiscal year 2018, we are lagging this production by about 20%, which is better than previous years, but still unacceptable. Areas that we're working on are workforce hiring, developmental training, quality, manufacturing, all the things you would think of, and also infrastructure upgrades. It's this last area where we need to concentrate. Thanks to an infusion of repair funds in FY18, we are able to schedule repairs on our highest priority equipment. As an example, let me just mention a uh, water tower that we have down at FRC East in Cherry Point that's used for the qualification of nozzles on our T-64 engines. Uh, this is a 50-year-old piece of equipment uh, that was continually unreliable, and for several months in 2017, we were unable to repair T-64 engines. With this uh, infusion of cash, we were able to develop a redesign and requalify that piece of equipment. Now, the next step is actually to modernize that piece of equipment and go from a water tower type of uh, process, which we're, I think we're the only ones that still use that technology, to an airflow type of qualification for our engine nozzles. So we absolutely appreciate the FY18 increase. Uh, it's going to go tos towards those most critical components, which are uh, greater than 25 years old on average. But also of importance is our facilities that have an average age of 58 years. Uh, more than half of our facilities are greater than 67 years old. A few of examples, uh, we have uh, no air conditioning down in our avionics maintenance facility in FRC Southeast in Jacksonville. That one actually I think is going to be uh, funded in 19, so we're looking forward to that one. But we also still have a paint and strip facility in Norfolk that has to shut down every time it rains. Uh, we have an uh, environmental control ventilation system in FRC Southwest that fails on a weekly basis. So these are the type of things that our artisans are working around. Our future investments in facilities and equipment modernization will be vital to ensure that our organic industrial facilities have the capability and the capacity to not only improve current performance, but to support the next generation of aircraft and engines. So similar to the Navy's shipboard optimization plan, Naval Aviation will put forward a modernization plan for our fleet readiness centers. We're starting this year with a comprehensive baseline of our facilities, test equipment, and tooling. 
Naval Aviation looks forward to working with this subcommittee and the larger Congress to achieve this end state, and we very much appreciate your continued support of our sailors and Marines, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Admiral, and we will now proceed with the round of questions, and again, Drew Warren will be maintaining the, strictly beginning right now, the five-minute rule. And uh, for uh, Vice Admiral Peters and uh, Lieutenant General Levy, is there a backlog for depot maintenance at any of the airframe at either the fleet readiness centers or the air logistic complexes? If so, how long? What's the operational impact? What's the cause? And what's the fix? Thank you, sir. So I'll answer on behalf of the Air Force. And to your question, is there a backlog, backlog for airframe uh, depot maintenance? And the Air Force, the answer is no. Uh, our, our system of how we perform depot maintenance and high-level overhaul requires that the airplane come in regularly, get serviced, and go back out. Uh, so we've maintained a steady rhythm of aircraft, and I would also offer components and engines because the airplane needs all of the parts to be complete, obviously. But we've maintained that steady flow of, of aircraft and components throughout the, the many decades in the past. Uh, where we have seen some challenges, however, has been in the supply chain that feeds some of that. Now that's a bit, uh, uh, has some challenges inside of it with a uh, small industrial base, in some cases some small vendors, and perturbations in funding that have occurred through CRs and sequestration have exacerbated that. But to your direct question about delays, the answer is no. In fact, we've actually used some of our capacity to help our, our shipmates to my left. So when we talk about depots in the industrial base, we often think of it as service unique. Air Force does Air Force, Navy does Navy, et cetera. But we're, our destinies are interconnected. So for example, sir, uh, I, in my command, I have what you commonly hear called the boneyard mm -hmm. uh, in Davis Monthan, at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona. I call it a national reservoir of aerospace capacity, mm -hmm. frankly. So we've pulled F-18s out and restored them to service to help our shipmates in the Navy, well, in the Department of the Navy with their readiness challenges. At our air logistics complex at Warner Robins, in, at Robins Air Force Base in Georgia, we are actually making center wing spars for F-18s. And that's, that's an example of how our enterprise interconnects to try to help each other out because even though we, we budget separately as services, we fight together as a joint team. And an impact on Navy readiness is an, air, is an impact on Air Force combat effectiveness. Thank you, sir. And hey, it, it's really encouraging to hear the uh, uh, inter-service cooperation. This is um, not always uh, recognized. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Admiral. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I agree completely with uh, General Levy, especially about the interconnectedness of our services. And uh, we do rely on each other for capability that's common, especially across the components. Uh, and uh, and our airframes that are that are common. For instance, our E6s are repaired uh, at Tinker Air Force Base. Our KC-130Js are repaired at Hill Air Force Base. Uh, and so we have a very close relationship uh, with the Air Force. In terms of backlog, uh, we do not have a substantial backlog on the aircraft and engine side. We have eliminated that uh, over the last couple of years in right-sizing our work in progress. Uh, on the component side, we do have aged work in progress, and uh, the impact of that is uh, it, it, it's a financial impact, uh, for one thing, on the depots, and burning down that aged whip is incredibly important to us. The financial impact is we end up working on components that may have been inducted several years previously, and now we're working on a different rate structure. Uh, so that is a, a focus area for the, the Navy depots. Um, and I believe I've answered your question. Sir. You, you certainly have, and thank you uh, both. Uh, and uh, Admiral Moore, how are we posturing shipyards so that they will be able to adapt to future challenges from technology and workforce perspectives? Yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I think the uh, the Naval Shipyard Optimization Plan that we submitted to Congress that this year addresses exactly your question. And uh, as we looked at the Naval Shipyards, you know, many of them over 200 years old, you know, we recognized that uh, these shipyards, uh, which were set up initially to build ships, were not positioned properly uh, to repair ships going into the future. And some of that was just the infrastructure was degraded, and some of it was from a technology standpoint. Uh, we didn't have the technology we needed in terms of infrastructure, IT backbones, et cetera. So the Naval Shipyard Optimization Plan is, gonna, is the Navy's uh, plan to address 
uh, your concerns going forward. It's a 20-year plan, $21 billion over 20 years that will get after all four naval shipyards. And as a result of that, you know, we'll see increased productivity and in, uh, going forward to support the 355-ship Navy. Super, thank you, and that's very appropriate. And we now proceed uh, to the uh, beautiful territory of Guam, uh, the site of the Guam Naval Shipyard. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for Admiral Moore. The FY 2018 NDAA directed the Navy to complete a review of depot level ship repair in the Western Pacific. Is this review nearing completion? And when does the Navy expect to submit it to the committee? Uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. Yes, that study is underway. Uh, it's being led by the Pentagon. We expect to have that uh, completed before the end of the fiscal year. Before the end of? This fiscal year. I see. All right, and we can depend on that, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, my second question is um, for both Admiral Moore and General Levy. Can you discuss the benefits permanent civilian personnel provide as part of your workforce at your depots and shipyards and suggested strategies for continue to incentivize and retain this part of your workforce? Uh, uh, we, since I have the mic on, I'll go ahead and uh, continue. Um, one, uh, the, our civilian workforce is the backbone of our ability to get the depot maintenance done. The, the 36,100 people in our public shipyards are primarily civilian personnel. I mean, we, we don't, and I, at NAVC, uh, we're quick to distinguish them as shipmates as well. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, what we need to do to con is we need to continue to hire. Uh, we need to continue to support pay raises where those are appropriate. Uh, we need uh, to upgrade our infrastructure and facilities. Uh, they're not looking for a Taj Mahal to work in, but they certainly want, want facilities uh, that uh, you know are clean and are air conditioned, et cetera, and that's not the case in all of our depots today. I think the, the Naval Shipyard Optimization Plan addresses that. And as far as hiring authorities, uh, you know, the hiring authorities that you gave us uh, for expedited hiring is crucial, and we appreciate that hiring authority going forward. I would say there's one thing that would help us there, you know, we, we have a 180 day cooling off period for retired military personnel before they can enter our depots. Uh, there's an opportunity as we try to hire them. We're, we're in a competition for talent, not only in our naval shipyards, but with the private sector. Uh, that would be something that would be, uh, would help be helpful to us as we take these young men and women that are coming out of the, our service that are technically capable and ready to go into the depots. And if they have to wait 180 days, sometimes we lose the opportunity to get them. So to lessen that 180 days. Yes, ma'am. General? Thank you, ma'am. So I'm going to piggyback on what Admiral Moore said about the 180 day, and then I'm going to move to the civilian piece, if you don't mind. So in my command, we perform depot maintenance on the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Fleet. So I have members of my, my airmen at our ICBM bases in the northern tier of the United States. If you're a 20-plus year Air Force missile maintenance mechanic, and you get out of the Air Force and you want to become a civil servant and work for us doing many of the same tasks but at, at an overhaul level, you must wait 180 days. So if you retire from Minot Air Force Base as a master sergeant and you have to wait 180 days and you have a mortgage and a family, et cetera, and before you can apply and then wait, depending on what hiring authority they hire under, sometimes up to four months to get hired, you can imagine we're going to lose that workforce. And there are not a lot of trade schools in the United States where we teach people how to do uh, maintenance on intercontinental ballistic missiles. Same thing with jet engine mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. And the Navy has the same problem across a variety of its skill sets. So, so relief in that area would be particularly useful for us. My sense is that the services have complied with the intent of Congress, which says don't hire retired military before 180 days. And while there's a waiver authority, the services uh, don't want to go against the will of Congress, so they've been very reluctant to exercise that waiver authority. I think the time is ripe for us. As we enter this era of a competition for talent, ma'am, uh, our services, and particularly our industrial artisans, uh, are a high-demand workforce. Recently, I just had a meeting with the Aerospace Industries Association and some others about competition for talent in the aerospace industry. We talk about a pilot shortage in the Air Force. But we have software engineer shortages, we have jet engine mechanic shortages, et cetera, because as the economy recovers, as airlines hire, both domestically and internationally, what we see is that demand signal for talent. And 
I would, I would echo Admiral Moore's comment about our appreciation for the expedited and direct hiring authorities and would ask that they be allowed to continue. Uh, I've mentioned before to some of the members that we would like to see that expanded because the way the language is written currently, what it does is it allows us to direct hire and expedite hire in a, in a limited set. I often liken it to this. I can direct hire the quarterback on my team today, but I can't direct hire the other members of the team. I need all the team in order to be successful. So the expansion of that so we can achieve the kind of velocity in our hiring system and bring those permanent civilian airmen onto our team and keep them there is essential for us to generate combat power for a fifth generation Air Force. Thank My you. My time has run out, but uh, one just final from the two of you. Do you want it completely eliminated or just a shorter period? Uh, since I have the mic, I, I would say I, I would like to see us have the opportunity to completely eliminate it. And, and here's why. Back to my example about a retiring master sergeant. If he or she has a mortgage or they have kids in oh, school. I understand. It, it, we don't want to lose that talent. We want them to be able to take that vital skill set and directly translate it as a civilian to our civil service workforce and keep adding value and capture that experience. Not only technical experience, ma'am, but it would offer leadership experience mm -hmm. because yeah. that's equally essential to getting the job done for us. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a second round if you. And, and thank you, Congresswoman Badayo. Uh, we now proceed to Chairman Rob Bishop. Thank you. I appreciate you guys being here when you could be actually out doing something worthwhile. Um, <laughs> and you can take the last answer off my time because I want to finish off on on the last thing you said, General Levy. Um, also, at the end of your oral statement, you talked about how as our weapon system is advancing techno technologically, so must our workforce to maintain it. And it is very clear that there is a nationwide shortage in STEM workers. As a liberal arts guy, that hurts me to say that, but it happens to be true. As well as the fact that our national employment rate is very high, is great, and it makes it more difficult to find people who are willing to work. So I'd like you to follow up on what you were talking about. What can we specifically do to incentivize the depots in their hiring practice? And what other, you mentioned some, but are there other specific obstacles that we can eliminate to help in this process of getting a, a, a talented workforce? Yes, sir, thank you for the question. So. There are a number of things I think we, we should collectively be doing as a nation. First of all, I, I would offer, and this is a long-term strategy, is we need to change the conversation about STEM education in the United States. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're just sort of um, managing the shortages, which uh, has near-term implications, of course, but in reality, until, we, until the nation produces enough STEM graduates, we're gonna continue to have this problem. And this isn't just a defense issue, sir. This is an economics issue. This is a international competitiveness issue in my view. And when I talk about an industrial base, both commercial and organic, that, that suffers from some shortages, this is one of the ways you get at that. I would offer that expanding the direct and expedited hiring authorities is really important. I would also offer that steady funding that allows us to have a steady drumbeat to, for demand signal to colleges and universities is also really important. Uh, we've had some really good success in our organization working with some of the state uh, four-year engineering schools because we've been a pretty predictable partner so they've been able to make infrastructure investments in engineering student output. Another thing that I would offer is our delays in getting security clearances create some significant challenges for us. That's not probably a hiring issue, but it's a, uh, I call it a, a, a uh, attractiveness place to work issue, right? If, you're gonna, if we're gonna hire you, if we had all the hiring authorities we thought we wanted and needed and we're gonna make you wait for some period of time to get your security clearance, that's not really very incentivizing to you to come to work for us. And frankly, we're in a competition for talent. Uh, the work is complicated and the skill sets required are very high. And the, as you mentioned, sir, the unemployment rate is, is going down. Uh, that's a good problem to have for the nation, but it certainly creates some challenges for all of us in the kind of skilled artisanship that we need to sustain our weapon systems, whether they're air breathing, whether they go at sea, whether they're cyber or in space. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that, especially you're talking about hiring authority and the security clearance delays. Uh, that is something I think Congress needs to, to look at to see how we can expedite that with you. Well, I, I got like a, two minutes. Let me come at one last thing. Gee, um, GAO did a, a report that talked about challenges and concerns with the global pool of spare parts for the F-35 for us and our international partners. Can you explain in, a, in like a minute and a half 
uh, anything about that issue and the construct that goes there. And um, additionally, if we were to authorize additional funding for spare parts, how can we assure that we get value in that global parts pool? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I, I can talk about it a little bit. And I would say that the construct we have is the construct that we signed up to, which uh, creates a global spares pool where the U.S. services and the partner nations in the F-35, and I'm not the F-35 program executive officer, so I want to be careful not to get out of my lane, but we created this global spares pool where we all put money in and we all receive some benefit. Uh, I would say it's early in the program yet. I, I think I will see... I would expect to see that mature and the depth of that sparing and spares pool grow over time. I think the larger issue, frankly, is the industrial repair capability for those spares, and it's, uh, it's somewhat in its infancy as a weapon system. Uh, remember, we're just now starting to get to the point where we're, go where we're going into full rate production. We just had our 300th airplane delivered uh, just last week, I believe it was. So we're early days yet. Uh, the funding would be helpful. I won't. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that, um, but the construct says that the partner nations, the the original nine people in the in the discussion, all benefit relatively equally from the money that's invested, and uh, so I'll leave it at that, sir. And uh, thank you very much, Chairman Bishop. We now proceed to Congressman Joe Courtney of Connecticut. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses uh, this morning. Um, Admiral Moore, on page three of your testimony, again, you walked through the issue of uh, the backup regarding uh, attack sub repair work. Um, you know, the fact that, again, NAPSI, um says that it wants to protect industrial base health, um, and maybe that's a, a, a way of trying to um, solve that problem in terms of the, the SSN uh, work that needs to happen. Um, you know, we had Secretary Spencer and Under Secretary Gertz up in Groton um, a couple months ago walk through the imminent uh, short-term valley, which nobody disputes once the Montpelier work um, wraps up. And the fact that, again, with the commencement of the uh, Virginia payload module program as well as Columbia, uh, if we if that valley occurs, you're adding risk to those programs in terms of just uh, you know a, a workforce that is showing really good strong growth in in both the metal trades and design work. So, uh, you know I, I guess we're we're really very close to to that event occurring, and I just I I, I don't see in in this testimony, you know. Uh, a response to, to that issue, which again, the, the secretary and the undersecretary completely did not dispute um, the fact that that's happening. So, so uh, you know, you have tools. I mean, I, I've been through this with your predecessor two times removed. You've heard me say this before, Admiral McCoy's uh, EMBOA uh, contracting process, which allows the Navy to move quickly to, to try and um, deal with these issues of, of uh, industrial uh, base uh, issues. So. Can you help us this morning in terms of just how, whether or not NAPSI intends to do anything in terms of that imminent uh, valley? Well, uh, the sh short answer is yes, we do. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we are looking right now at, at uh, the FY20 and 21 workload, not only in the Naval Shipyards, but obviously uh, up at EB. And, and, and frankly, we have responsibility for the health of the entire industrial base. So um, I think you're going to see here in the relatively short term, we're going to come to some decisions that would, would move, was going to move some submarine work into the private sector in that time frame to address your concerns. And I think we learned a pretty hard lesson on Boise, uh, which was we waited, you know, too late in the game uh, to make that decision. So what, what I've talked to Navy leadership about is uh, two things. One, we need to, to look two to three years or more out because I have a pretty good sense of what workload I need and what I have in the public shipyards. And where I have uh, workload peaks, uh, we should, instead of waiting to the last second to see if we could hang on to that work ourselves, I think it makes sense for us to go ahead and uh, let's provide ourselves some additional capacity by putting the work in the private sector. So I, I think you're going to see uh, here pretty shortly, we're going to make some decisions that will, I think, address your specific concern. But I think also uh, the other thing is we've learned uh, be, you know, with Montpelier at Electric Boat and, and Helen and Columbus now at, at uh, Newport News um, that uh, you know the skill set required to do uh, maintenance is different than it is for new construction. So when you give them repair work after they haven't had repair work in a while and you expect them to immediately perform uh, like a Swiss watch, you find they're challenged to do that. So we're, we're challenged 
Uh, EB's been challenged on Montpelier. We're going to be late there, and, and, and Newport News is being challenged on, on Helena. We're only going to be a little late there. Some of that's because we haven't built that proficiency up. And so the Navy's having discussions that maybe it would be in our best interest to, on a regular basis, keep some submarine repair work in the private sector, not only as a relief valve for the public yards uh, as we level load them, but also to establish that proficiency level so that you know, when we do get ourselves into uh, a crisis, we've got a partner over there that's performed that work on a regular basis that can do that going forward. So I, I think uh, we're ready to address your concerns, and I think you going forward, I think we'll be able to satisfy what you, know, what you, you and I have been talking about here. Right. Well, thank you. I mean, we obviously will be watching, uh, you know, great, very closely um, in terms of what develops. The uh, so I think your analysis regarding repairs versus construction, you know, makes perfect sense, and, and certainly uh, we've heard that um, up in the yard there. I, you know, obviously a layoff and a, and a potential loss of skills is even more um, harmful to to the overall program. So. Um, uh, you know, having some repetition in terms of repair work uh, to keep, you know, so that, to avoid delays, I think makes a lot of sense. And um, again, as, as usual, our office, you know, looks forward to working with you in terms of how this unfolds. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Courtney. We now proceed to Congressman Austin Scott of Georgia. General Levy, it's uh, not often you hear an LSU grad admit to the direct hiring of a quarterback, but I appreciate your admission. Uh, as, as you know, our depots are an essential component of uh, readiness and, and our national security. We've discussed this many times, and uh, we've discussed the increased funding uh, by this committee for sustainment. Uh, what steps are you taking at Warner Robins Air Logistics Center to invest in the workforce, to recapitalize the assets, to improve operations, efficiencies, and capabilities? And how do you expect this uh, will improve readiness for the aviation fleets in the Air Force? Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for the comment about uh, LSU football, duly noted, sir. Uh, so with respect to Warner Robins, we've made a variety of investments both in infrastructure and in the human capital because, frankly, sir, people are more important than hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just heard Admiral Moore talk about the skill set deltas between making new stuff versus repairing things. Uh, and the skill sets of the artisans at Robins are what actually sets it apart. So in the past year or so, we've hired over 1,000 new employees to accommodate the increasing workload. And we've partnered with the uh, technical, tr technical college system in Georgia to give us the skill set so when they come in, they're much more uh, mission ready than we've had in the past. In, in years gone by, that's not necessarily been a feature of how we brought people on board. Coupled with the direct hiring authority that we've been allowed to, to have thanks to the Congress, that's given us some additional velocity. So on, on the workforce side, I think we're on the right trajectory. Then on the, on the infrastructure side, and I would tell you there's never enough money for infrastructure. That's probably a whole separate conversation in and of itself. But we've actually taken some of our own investment dollars and put it into an advanced metal finishing facility at, at Warner Robins Air Logistics Complex. Now, advanced metal finishing is probably not the glitziest topic that comes before the subcommittee, but I would tell you when it comes to chrome plating or uh, cadmium plating of, of important aerospace components, it's essential because you have to have them for the airplane. They're, they can be environmentally difficult to work with, and there can be hazards to the workforce. So we took investments and we automated that process so we could take the humans out of the loop, achieve a better product much more quickly for us and our joint teammates. So hopefully that gets to your question, sir. So, so one of the things that's changing in, uh, in aeronautics is the, uh, how, how we're integrating data and uh, effectively artificial intelligence into uh, forecasting uh, repairs and, and the need for repair parts and components and improve the process for uh, conducting maintenance. What are the Air Force's greatest obstacles to fully integrating uh, the available analytical tools into fleet maintenance? That's a, a terrific question. So the, currently in the logistics and sustainment system, sir, we operate over 230 information technology systems, IT systems. Uh, it's uh, it's a disparate. They don't talk to each other. I often describe it as we are data rich and knowledge poor. We have lakes of data, but given our disparate IT systems that have evolved over the years, it's very difficult for us to to 
pull that together to make to gain the kinds of insights that we want. We've recently uh, undertaken an initiative for condition-based maintenance, whereby we are now developing analytical engines to look at that data, draw some meaningful insights, so we can do more predictive maintenance, have the parts, have the people either at the air logistics complexes or in the field, because remember, unlike the Navy, uh, my two Navy colleagues to the left, I own the supply chain for the Air Force. The Navy has a separate supply core. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's important for me, right? It's not just what I do at the air logistics complexes. It's what I do at Al Udeed in the desert. It's what I do at Misawa in Japan. It's what I do at Osan in Korea. And so having that analytic engine allows me to understand what the demand signal is going to look like based on the wear and usage and brake patterns of the weapon system. It's not just the airplane either. It's the support equipment, the vehicles, the test equipment. You need all of that to make the airplane serviceable. So that condition-based maintenance system that we've undertaken has really started to yield dividends with us uh, on things like the B-1, the B-52, and the C-5, which, as you well know, sir, is currently sustained at the Air Logistics Complex at Warner Robins. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it, it, as, as we proceed through uh, the year, I'm interested in any comments. I know one of the key issues is who actually owns the data. When, when we, as the American taxpayers, uh, pay for the development of a system, it baffles me that in the contracting that we don't uh, own the data rights. And so I hope that in any addition, any future contracting for any weapon systems, that that is a part of it, that we actually own the data, the idea that they can charge us for um, for something that we paid to develop is it, it, it's, it's just absolutely unfair to the taxpayers of the United States. Gentlemen, I appreciate your service. Thank you, Congressman Scott. We now proceed to Congressman Salud Carbajal of California. Thank you, Chairman Wilson. My questions are both for Admiral Moore and General Levy on the civilian workforce. Last month, the Office of Personnel Management sent to Congress a request to cut annuities, reduce, then eliminate the federal retiree cost of living adjustments, and eliminate the federal employee retirement system annuity supplement for federal government civilians. With all this, how would these proposals affect your ability to recruit and retain a qualified federal workforce, civilian workforce? Sir, I, I, I'd have to take that as a look up. I'm not familiar with the specifics of the o, OPM uh, proposals. You know, I can speak to the fact that, uh, you know, the workforce itself, uh, you know, is an important part of what we do. Um, they they're proud of the work they do. They are they while they don't get paid on, on the same par as maybe their civilian counterparts do. They do it because they're working on something that's bigger than themselves. So I, I don't know that I can comment on this on the specifics of the of the issue there relative to the workforce uh, without knowing the specifics of w what's going on from OPM, sir. Admiral, I appreciate your patriotism, um, but I think we all do it for a country, but. Uh, our men and women in, in the military, as well as the civilian workforce that supports our national security, deserve to have good benefits. So um, I'm sure if our military personnel didn't have good health care pensions, uh, that would affect our ability to retain and attract individuals in the military as well. Um, General Levy? Sir. I, too, am not familiar with the OPM language, so I can't comment directly. But what I would offer is a, a, maybe a way to think about the, the problem that is before us. You know, often in government service, we've had the mindset that, that people were cheap, cost-wise, they were plentiful, and that the work was easy. I would say that in the modern uh, DOD that we find ourselves in, as we move from an Iron Age DOD to an Information Age DOD, people are scarce. They cost more, and the work is infinitely more sophisticated, and I would add that we are in a war for talent. We talk about pilot shortages in the Air Force, but I would tell you I have software engineer challenges, I have jet engine mechanic challenges, and we could talk about a variety of skills, but I think you get the message. My point is uh, we, need a, we need to be an attractive place to work in this competition for talent. Uh, benefits is important. Uh, so is good working conditions. You heard the Admiral refer to that a few moments ago. Uh, but so is the notion that uh, they are serving their nation. In fact, m much of my workforce are veterans. Uh, they've, they've worn the uniform of some branch of the military, and then they come over to the civil servant side. Uh, and so 
this is all part and parcel, I think, of a larger t uh, discussion, sir, about are we, the U.S. government, an attractive place to work to bring the, to bring the best and brightest talent in, whether it's the DOD or Department of the Treasury or Interior, et cetera? Uh, that's, that would be my, my perspective. Thank you. And secondly, the recently published fiscal year 2018-19 National Defense Business Operations Plan, a supplement to the, the 2018 National Defense Strategy, stated, quote, the department's lethality and readiness are, no, are not just a function of our service members. DOD's civilian workforce is essential to sustaining the viability and capabilities of, all of an all-volunteer force providing critical equipment, maintenance, logistics, and engineering expertise. Can you both elaborate on the value of the civilian workforce to the department's mission? I think you've already touched on that, but if you could just touch on it a little bit more. Yes, sir, I, I, would, uh, I would say that we simply put, we can't get the job done without them. So the 43,000 airmen in my command, uh, approximately 70% are civil servants. Now, I wouldn't tell you that unless you ask me, because I don't, I don't distinguish what outfit they wear. They're airmen, and I have the expectations of them as I would anybody that wore the uniform. They're essential. We simply can't get the job done without them. We can't sustain. We can't project. We can't set theaters, open and fight theaters. It's just that simple. Um, we could talk for hours, but it's just that simple. But the other thing that I think is lost on many is that our civilians deploy. Now, our department, our nation can compel me to deploy. We can't compel our civilians to deploy, but yet many of them volunteer when they don't have to, to deploy. That's the caliber of the, the men and women that join our civil service. And so being the right kind of workplace, the right kind of employer with the right kinds of opportunities is how you continue to, to attract and retain that kind of talent that will provide for the common defense in the years going forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We, we really needed to hear that because sometimes we lose sight of that uh, importance. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Carpenter. We now proceed to Congressman Steve Russell, a, a very appreciated combat veteran himself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here uh, today, all three of you. Uh, and General Levy, I appreciate the uh, comments on IP data and how it affects sustainment. I know this is something that we've talked about uh, in the past, and, and I associate with uh, Representative Scott's comments about the, the technical data, and I know this is something that all the services face uh, it can really throw a monkey wrench on sustainment. Um, I would like to ask you uh, about the health of the defensive supply chain. You touched on it uh, briefly, and, uh, and Admiral Moore, I'd like to uh, also get your, because I know it's a different system uh, for each of you. Yes, sir. So thank you for the, for the question. The intellectual property is a significant challenge, and, and uh, Representative Scott brought up a great point you know, about what do we fund, what do we get, how do we get it. I would say that in the, in the 21st century, the, in, the inf intellectual property and the, and the data will be probably more valuable, valuable than the hardware itself. So to your question about supply chain and intellectual property, for example, the absence of intellectual property cre creates some challenges for us in managing the supply chain. Uh, the supply chain that I do manage, and, and I'll come back to that, and I've actually brought a couple of examples for the, for the subcommittee to see, but the problem in the supply chain is it's extraordinarily brittle. We believe that the defense industrial base, uh, both commercial and organic, is sort of this uh, arsenal of democracy. That's simply not the case anymore, um, particularly for sustainment. We have an, a, a large number of the vendors that we buy from are, there's only one vendor in the marketplace, single source vendor. Not sole source contract, single source vendor. And in some cases, we have no vendors. And these are small companies, sir, the, uh, 10, 15, 20 employees. And when there's irregular or in, and or inadequate funding, and we perturbate the funding chain, which perturbates the demand signal, which then radiates uncertainty to those small businesses, they make decisions. And there is no 1-800-B52 parts phone number, I call. There is no... 1-800-F-18 parts that the Navy calls. These are small businesses that are essential. An airplane needs all the parts. The ship needs all the parts, right, whether it's a $300,000 part or a 50-cent part. And so in many cases, that's an impactor to readiness for us. If we can't get someone to build or make the part for us, uh, we sometimes end up doing it ourselves. And that sometimes takes longer. 
and that delays readiness. That means the ship's not out at sea, an airplane's not in the sky, and that means that we as joint teammates are not being good wingmen to one another. And so we worry very much about that. Do you have a, I actually brought, sir, uh, a couple exa uh, examples of what happens when the supply chain goes right and when it goes wrong. And this one's actually all about intellectual property, and I'll leave these exhibits for the subcommittee um, because my lawyers tell me that's what I have to say. Um, but th this is actually an ejection seat cover, I'm sorry, an ejection seat handle cover for a B-52 bomber. Looks like a fairly innocuous piece of plastic, right? We tried for over a year to get industry to bid on this. The normal Fed biz ops, all the things you normally do in government contracting, nobody would bid on this. The airplane needs this part. The last B-52 was built before I was born. Finally, some of my engineers, and with some of our additive manufacturing capabilities, said, you know, I think we can do this. So we invested 40 hours of our engineering workforce time. They reverse engineered this part, and they 3D printed it for $56. <laughs> Imagine if we had more intellectual property and we could That's do right. more of this. We, when we talk about 3D printing, we tend to talk about the really glitzy things that uh, you see hanging off, an, off of an airplane. But this is just as important as some of those other parts and just as hard to come by. Mm. I'll give you another example. This is a bracket that's used to hold a piece of tooling to drill out holes in a bulkhead on an F-16. That doesn't sound very exciting. But if you don't drill those holes out right, you can't put the landing gear on the F-16. And you can't see where the holes get drilled until our guys came up with a way to make this bracket. So you can put the drill in the right place, drill the hole, and go from two weeks of downtime to two days of downtime. That's readiness. That's what the organic industrial base can bring to the fight in terms of driving up readiness, driving down cost, driving down risk, but it's heavily dependent on intellectual property. Yeah. Thank you, sir. No, that was, was a good answer. Admiral Moore, uh, would you care to comment on some of that? And, and of course, Admiral Peters, uh, I'm limited on time, but. Now, I brought a couple of parts from an aircraft carrier, but they're too big to fit the conference, <laughs> room, so I've left, a, left them outside. Right. Um, I, I, would, I would echo General Levy's comment on the, you know, the predictability and stability of funding. We often talk at the tier one level, you know, the, the folks that are actually, you know, the, the Northrop Grumman's, the Boeing's, the building the planes and the ships. Uh, and they are impacted by unpredictable funding, but less so than the smaller tier two, tier three mom and pop shops that are providing the, the really the supply chain for building these things. And so I would echo exactly what he said is there, when we talk about funding instability, and that I think what really hurts the Navy the most is down at the folks that are actually, you know, uh, the small businesses that are providing the critical supply chain parts for our ability to go build these aircraft carriers and, and ships and maintain them going forward. Thank you. I yield back. Sorry, unless uh, the chairman wants uh, no. Admiral Peters. Sorry, uh, Mr. Kana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, your service to uh, the country. Now, we've been working on a uh, bipartisan bill. Uh, Congressman Russell is actually on it about how do we modernize uh, the federal agencies' uh, information technology systems. And I'd be curious uh, your uh, experience uh, in modernizing the information technology systems uh, with our uh, military and how that has gone and whether there's anything federal agencies can learn from that or whether there's still more work to be done. Uh, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, I'll address it in terms of uh, Navy ERP. Uh, that's a system that we've had some success with, but it's not deployed across all of our organizations. In particular, we are, are just now beginning to deploy it across our aviation depots. Uh, and that's an area that we need to accelerate uh, so that we have end-to-end -end visibility on all of our assets. And uh, just as an example, uh, we've, we've recently stood up ERP capability at a kitting facility down at FRC Southeast. And we're, so we're going through the growing pains of establishing that capability there. But even as we move through and complete those kits and they're ready to be shipped out to the fleet, uh, at, when they're shipped out, then that system, uh, the tracking of that system is now dependent on different databases and spreadsheets. And so uh, I think a first priority is 
modernize ERP, open up uh, all the functionality that's available there, expand it across our uh, industrial base, and then maybe even move to the next uh, phase, which is operational. Over. Thank you, sir. It's a it's a great question, and one of the you know one of the big challenges we have in our depots today is we try to inf update uh, the the IT systems we have. We've got an ongoing effort in the naval shipyards to provide a, a 21st century infrastructure and IT uh, that will allow us to kind of link together all the processes we have there to buy material, build build uh, integrated plans, et cetera. And it's a real challenge. I think that the thing that we've learned here is you got to plan ahead and think far enough in advance. Don't bite off more than you can chew. There's a tendency to want too many bells and whistles and these things up front. Uh, go after commonality as much as you can. And so we've, as we've worked through what we call NEMI's tech refresh in the naval shipyards, we're trying to leverage off of the ERP so we don't create these boutique solutions, which over the long haul uh, really hurts us. And the last thing is you, you got to build the cyber piece in up front uh, and factor that into your decision making. I think those would be kind of things we've learned uh, on the Navy mm -hmm. side of the house. Thank you, sir. So we have similar challenges, and part of this I think we all face is, is becoming fire compliant, so we're audit ready, too. That's the other piece of this, which our systems have not historically been designed to do. Uh, I would also offer that the acquisition process for buying uh, ERP and ERP-like systems has been somewhat uh, disruptive. We've been trying for a number of years to get a maintenance repair and overhaul ERP in our air logistics complex system. Uh, we just got that on contract. We also now have our supply chain forecasting system on contract, uh, and those two systems actually integrate very nicely together. Again, that's a little bit different than the Navy model because I own the supply chain and the repair chain. So I, in essence, have the entire logistics kill chain from factory to flight line and back. And so that's what we're in the process of doing, taking those 230 systems and, and necking them down. Um, I, I would offer, though, that one thing that we don't talk about with these IT systems is the IT infrastructure. We tend to talk about the IT system, but you need comm pipes and bandwidth and switches and all of those things that aren't very glamorous, but as the amount of IT systems have exploded in the DOD and across the entire federal government, I'm not sure that our, our I'll call it IT infrastructure has kept up. And so as we go to these systems that I just referred to, one of the key components for us is uh, to make sure that we have the infrastructure so the system has something to work on so you don't have an exquisite system, but you watch the little blue swirly wheel. And then, of course, as Admiral Moore said, uh, baking in the cybersecurity is absolutely critical up front, not just for the system itself, but for the rest of the air power factory that we operate. Thank you, sir. A quick uh, question, comment. I was struck by your comment, General Levy, about uh, retention in your previous question. It reminded me of uh, Ronald Reagan's quote where he said, I know the best civilians aren't in government because the private sector would hire them away. And I represent a district uh, with Apple, Google, uh, Intel. Uh, on this committee, of course, you have people like uh, Congressman C uh, Carbajal and Gallagher and uh, Russell who have answered the call to service in the military. But I wonder, what, what can you do with the young tech folks to attract them to go into public service? Well, we talked somewhat about the kind of the HR policies that the government has. But uh, I would say that, um, and I'll give you a good example from my engineering workforce, if I can get them on board, they stay. My turnover rate for software engineers is lower than industry. And you say to yourself, well, why is that? Because you don't pay as much. Because they do something that's meaningful, it's impactful. We give those young men and women out of college, once we get them on board, you know, all the hiring stuff aside, we give them something that, that most college graduates don't get to do. For example, recently we hired somebody from Georgia Tech, brought them in. Once they got on board, within two weeks they were working on night vision targeting systems for AC-130 gunships. That's compelling. That's, you can tell your family and friends, I went to work today and I made a difference. Yeah, I didn't make the salary that my friend over at this other commercial firm made, but I made a difference. And so part of this is a call, a national call to service. We often believe the call to service looks like Here this. Here, Levy, if I may, I'm sorry. Sure. The, the time's expired. We're going to have time, I believe, for a second round of questioning, but I, I, I think it was an excellent question. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It sounds good to call you that, Austin. Don't get too, you know, excited about it, though. Um, Thank you, Pride. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to circle back on uh, what I think is sort of an emerging focal point in this hearing. Um, we had this, uh, the annual industrial capabilities report, which was released in last May, I believe, from the Pentagon. And they talked about a lot of things we've been talking about, 
which is that the greatest challenge that could harm domestic defense capabilities is the demographics of the workforce, right? And in particular, they said only 39% of the current workforce is under the age of 45, and that's a huge long-term threat. And uh, General Levy, I'd like to sort of highlight a portion of your testimony, which I think is very good and very important. I mean, you talk about how 80% of what you do, or you, you depend on an 80% civilian workforce, 89% if you include contractors or commercial airmen. And you have, you talked a, a, a lot about how an antiquated civilian hiring system constrains our ability to effectively compete with industry for a quali qualified workforce. And also, all of you have talked about the need to, to attract our STEM patriots, the next generation, which this report also highlights. So at the risk of being repetitive, um, could you kind of, again, explain in simple language that even a Marine like me could understand, um, what, where do the constraints come from? And then what is the, the right fix for us to pursue? You talked about a waiver process before, but DOD is not really interested in exercising the waiver because I think it defies congressional intent. Can you just sort of clarify both the problem and then the uh, prospective solution, if you will? Yes, sir. So um, I'll try to make it Marine friendly, but I, I would happen to quote uh, a Marine. Who Pictures would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, a, but a famous Marine once said, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. Indeed. And that's what, this, that's what this hearing really is about. So first of all, I would offer that we need a national level conversation about the value of work uh, in this kind of trade space. Um, we, we really just don't talk to young men and women about what, what does it mean to become a jet engine mechanic or, Navy, or an aerospace worker or any of the other skill sets that we all collectively need in order to do our job. Um, so I think that's really important for us. Then the other thing I, I, uh, I'll go back to is being able to bring people in quickly and capture them into the company fast. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Commercial firms go to colleges and they hire you when you're a junior if you're an engineer. They say basically, if you graduate, here's a letter of offer. If you, as long as you get your degree, you're coming to work for us. That's the kind of agility in the marketplace that we need to have. So there's a conversation about the value of non-four-year degreed work, mm. and then there's a series of hiring, um, I'll call them personnel actions or, or modifications that you have to have. And then the third thing you talked about was uh, former military, the 180-day waiver. Uh, I believe that's really, I think we're leaving a lot of talent behind when we do that. Uh, and so how we modify that, I think, is, is essential. Um, we face an aging workforce. I don't think any of us would push back on that, on that commentary. And so incentivizing by word and deed the next generation of airmen, whether it's civilian airmen or military airmen or sailor, I think is going to be essential for us to have this, this national insurance policy that we call the defense industrial, organic industrial base for our kids and our grandkids, sir. Uh, can I just, because I'm running out of time, um, you know, obviously we've, the, the, the big conceptual shift in the national defense strategy, national security strategy is sort of moving towards recognizing that we're in and must continue to prepare for an era of great power competition with China and Russia. Um, obviously, we, we'd like to prevent great power conflict with Russia and China, avoid World War III, but in the unfortunate circumstance that we'd find ourselves in such a great power conflict, uh, conflict how do you assess the ability of the industrial base and the associated logistics infrastructure to surge, to meet what our demands would be? Well, uh, today the industrial base is sized to meet the capacity that we have, and so uh, it has limited surge capacity in it, mm. frankly. Uh, and I think, you know, you can go back and read Freedom's Forge and talk about World War II and, and, and the lessons learned there, uh, but if we were to get into a major conflict today, I mean, we would respond rapidly, but the surge capacity doesn't exist on day one. And we would have to work pretty quickly to go to, to raise the, the number of people and, and have the facilities ready to do that. I, and I've run out of time, but I, I think it's, I mean, it's so difficult because in contrast to World War II, I mean, you can't sort of like take these Ford factories and get them to start producing aircraft now. It's just far more complex. So I'll hopefully circle back in the next round. Thank you all. Uh, Ms. Hart. Thank you Jerry, very much, uh, and good to see you again, uh, General Levy. I enjoyed uh, touring Tinker and, and seeing the great work that you're uh, doing down there in my uh, colleague's district, and uh, wanted to 
follow up on what you were saying about the, the security clearance backlog, because that's something that uh, we're looking at at O&I uh, committee, and uh, that's something we're trying to address. And as the DOD takes on that responsibility through the NDAA, and they're working on that, uh, what do you think is the timeline that would be acceptable to civilians? What should be the goal? I mean, do you think if we could get a security clearance um, a process so it's down to six months, uh, do you think they would stick around or, uh, you know, it's far beyond that sometimes right now? Yes, ma'am. Great, great to be with you as well. Thank you. Um, the security clearance problem has been a problem since I've been in uniform, 33 years, and I'd, I have not seen it really significantly improve. It gets a little better, a little worse, but it's sort of, I mean, it took two years for my last update, for example. Um, just incredibly long time. To your question, um, so when the DOD takes, takes that responsibility back in-house, my understanding of the language is that security clearances that are already in process, and I think that's 300,000 plus, will remain with OPM, and only new ones going forward will, will be initiated and then processed by the DOD. So, so my only point of bringing that up is to manage expectations that once DOD does it, all these things that are already in process probably won't, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't expect to necessarily see those resolved quickly. To your specific question about timeline, uh, I'd like to see us get it done in four months. Uh, that's a stretch goal, I, I know that, and I, I also know that doing a security clearance um, is requires a lot of legwork, a lot of investigating, a lot of, and if you've lived a lot of places, it's more complicated, et cetera. But I, I'm not 100% convinced that we're leveraging technology as much as we should be. Um, and I, I think there's some opportunity for, com for compressing. Uh, I would offer too that uh, one of the things we do in my command is we do cons constraints-based management. We map the process from soup to nuts. And then we look at the constraints and we go attack that first biggest constraint and shrink it, and then the next, and the next. I would offer that the security clearance process might be uh, might be overdue for an analysis like that, uh, so we could figure out where the real friction points are and drive that down, whether it's in OPM, DoD, or at the at the member slash local level, if that uh, if that makes any sense. Very good. Appreciate that input, yes, uh, Vice Admiral Moore. I understand the Department of Defense has sought significant increases in facilities, sustainment, restoration, and modernization uh, funding, specifically for demolition of facilities that do not meet operational requirements, and in some cases hinder the readiness of the military across the globe. In response, Congress has boosted funding for FSRM in previous fiscal years to tackle the challenge of maintaining facilities. Uh, demolition of these buildings is important to sustaining readiness for the warfighter and reducing potential health and safety risk at DOD installations. Uh, for instance, I understand that Norfolk Naval Shipyard will require some infrastructure demolition and improvement in order to meet the Navy's growing demand signal for submarine maintenance. So can you explain the process used to identify buildings for demolition as well as the process used to prioritize demolitions across the DOD. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely, a Norfolk Naval Shipyard has some buildings uh, that have been there for, in many cases, 100 years or more that uh, we need to get rid of. Uh, I think if you were to go to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard or to Puget or Pearl Harbor, you would find the same challenges there. Uh, we've tried to address this in our comprehensive report to Congress this year on Naval Shipyard optimization. Uh, that plan actually addresses and prioritizes the work in, in the shipyards and which buildings we would go after first. Uh, in particular, we, you know, we'll try and demolish buildings where we can take that green field and put something there immediately that would help us become more productive. So we're going to prioritize uh, the removal of buildings where we could, we could insert a new building or new technology the quickest that would get us more productive uh, at the naval shipyards. Very good. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, the Army depots have uh, conveyed to me for years they've, how they've struggled with carryover limitations. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've been informed that's not as much of a concern for the naval shipyards. Is that, a, is that accurate? Yes, sir. I, I think a part of that's because the naval shipyards are mission funded. So the working capital fund uh, rules on carryover are different. So in the naval shipyards, uh, we're not as constrained there, although I would tell you, 
at the end of the day, we try to limit the carryover because everybody does. Because yeah. carryover just right. means churn in the future years. So right. I, I don't have the ch same challenges I think that uh, Emil Peters has in in his ready centers or General Levy may have in his uh, air depot. So, so tell me what kind of carryover struggles you have. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the main constraint associated with carryover is uh, when you're accomplishing work that was paid for in a prior year and your cost is higher the following year, yeah. then you're going to, that's going to upset your, your NOR, mm -hmm. your net operating result, uh, which we watch very carefully and will have some implications for future funding years. Uh, but I think we, we manage the carryover accordingly. So I wouldn't, I would not describe that, uh, the carryover limitations are a major issue for us because we, we have to uh, manage our carryover. General, are they a major issue for you? So, sir, thanks for the question. We typically break carryover into three buckets, if you will. The airplanes, the airframes, the commodities, and software. In the airframe and commodity area, I would echo my two colleagues and say that, uh, I mean, there are puts and takes every year, but just at, at, a, at a macro level, it's not really something that, that keeps us that awake at night. I run a $16 billion a year business. And so as the CEO, I think about that from a business perspective. And as the Admiral said, you, managing the rate structures and the cost structures and what that means to my shareholders, i.e. the Air Force and the taxpayer and my joint partners is really important to me. What I would tell you is that we do have some challenges with carryover in software. The software construct, the way we define software in the DOD 5000, the way we fund it, with different appropriations, et cetera. We want to buy it and build it and take care of it like we do hardware. It's an antiquated notion. It's intellectually not compatible with a 21st century DOD. And by extension, because I have 4,000 software engineers in my organization who do much of that work, the work that they do, uh, the carryover in the software universe, I think, is, is really a bit of a challenge for us. Software really doesn't care about the fiscal year boundaries. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily get produced in the same kind of discrete chunks that a jet engine or an airplane or a ship gets produced in. And so if there were some, some things we could do to change that piece of the universe, we would be very appreciative because, frankly, our ability to, to wield and uh, launch ones and zeros in the future will be the key to combat dominance in, uh, in a great powers conflict. Well, to that end, uh, because I, this has been something expressed to me repeatedly over the years from the Army depots uh, around the country, uh, I asked General Perna to draft some language that he thought would remedy that, and uh, he did, and I, I put it in this year's NDAA. Uh, I don't know if y'all have seen that, but I would ask you to look at it and see if it scratches your itch. If not, get, let me know what you need, because this is something that we, we, didn't, we don't need to let go on any longer, but I would urge you to, to look at that language. Uh, last question I wanted to ask uh, of y'all. We've heard about this technology uh, challenge, you know, trying to get high-tech young people to want to go into public service. What are the other critical skill sets that y'all, because I don't hear that much from, from my world, but what are the critical skill sets y'all are worried about retaining in the industrial base? Yes, sir, uh, to answer that question, I I would point us back to the comment associated with our aging workforce. And so our, our more modern aircraft in particular are not just about uh, drilling holes and bucking rivets. Uh, we, we need to educate the current workforce even as we try to attract, you know, the future workforce. And we're doing that through some education programs and the, the workforce has actually responded to it very positively which uh, I was a little bit surprised, but pleasantly surprised about. And so we're, we're putting our workforce under a kind of an education development program, those that are, are interested in that. And so they're learning new skills, they're learning how to uh, use uh, computer controlled equipment like lathes and jigs and things like that that make our work more precise. And then on the engineering and logistics side, uh, we're using new technologies and new tools to be able to provide repairs. So okay. thank you. My time's expired. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mike Rogers. Uh, and these issues are so important, we'll proceed to a second round. Uh, and even before, um, as we begin, and I'll uh, ask the first question, but uh, as I think of uh, Depos, uh, something's so inspiring to me uh, with the uh, technologies we have today of, uh, of uh, barcode that uh, equipment can be identified instantly uh, and found uh, instantly. 
uh, with the um, uh, cell phones uh, capability where people can communicate in the most remote areas uh, of the world. How, uh, what opportunities, and I, it was so inspiring to me, I visited the Theater Distribution Center in Kuwait uh, uh, during um, the conflict with General Abe Turner. And uh, it was just incredible to me to see uh, how sophisticated and, and the opportunities that you have uh, to serve our uh, service members. I can particularly remember visiting a South Carolina Guard unit uh, in Afghanistan, and they, were, um, they weren't really complaining, but they said the roller in front of, the, uh, of their vehicle was not working properly. It missed the pin. And I said, well, where's the pin? They said, well, we're looking into it. I said, okay. Uh, the moment I got to the car, I think it comes from Medaio was there to make sure that I followed through appropriately. I immediately called back to General Turner. I said, hey, please get the pin uh, uh, here to coast uh, as soon as possible. And so, again, the, the capabilities we have today, uh, I want to thank you for um, advancing the technologies. And so, um, Admiral uh, Peters, we've learned many lessons, as I've indicated, from the sustained equipment during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, as well as we conducted equipment resets in the global war on terrorism following the periods of the highest operational tempo. So how do we ensure that we have incorporated these lessons and technologies and are applying them to the future anticipated sustainment needs? Sir, uh, agree completely. Uh, it, the barred code technology is actually fairly simple to incorporate, and uh, we generally establish a dollar value for where that makes sense. Uh, the next step of that uh, discussed a little bit earlier is incorporating that into our Navy ERP system so that we have end-to-end -end visibility for all of our assets. So track, so implementing barcode easy, uh, actually having complete inventory management is the next step. Well, it just, uh, uh, the opportunities we have today are just unimaginable. I can remember as a uh, second lieutenant being in, in charge of the supply room at the armory and it was uh, overwhelming uh, to find anything. And so uh, on a, another positive note, we now proceed to Congresswoman Badayo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think any three of you could answer it, I guess, my next question. How does the Air Force and the Navy assess the maximum executable level of depot workload when developing the budget request? And what are the primary factors that limit the ability to increase the maximum executable level? Well, the maximum executable level is based on uh, how many people is the capacity in, in the yards to do the work. And uh, we want to prevent a Boise-like availability we've had in the past. So when we determine the maximum funding, uh, we look at a couple of things. We look at the what workload do we have, what capacity do I have in the yard. And then the big constraint is how fast can I hire? That's really the, the driving factor. Mm -hmm. uh, in today's environment, the unemployment rate is at 3.8 percent. As General Levy has articulated uh, many times, we are in this competition for talent there. That is the thing that is, uh, that is the biggest challenge for me today is how fast can I ramp up? And so, you know, when I go back and have this discussion about max executable, it's really the discussion really gets down to how fast can I hire and then train them to be ready to be the artisans that I need. Mm -hmm. General, is about the same thing for you, or yes, ma'am. I, I would say it's it's very similar. We operate, you know, from a fairly similar perspective. I would offer, from a strategic level, though, one of the things we've done over the past twenty or so years if we, is that we've set an organic industrial base that's designed for optimal efficiency and perhaps not optimal effectiveness. So you you heard uh, Admiral Moore talk about well, I you know if you tell me to if you tell me you want me to do more, I'm lead time away from hiring slash training my workforce. Because we've built a system that has just enough workforce for just the amount of work we want to do today. So uh, somebody uh, mentioned, or Admiral Moore mentioned a few minutes ago about surge capability and capacity, right? This really goes to what do you want the organic industrial base to do? Do you want it to be sort of a just enough, just in time? Mm -hmm. Or do you want it to have some buffer, some what I call elasticity in it, so that when the crisis occurs, You've got that expansion capability, and I would submit that you absolutely need that because we won't have six months to prepare and build up for the next war. It's going to happen like that. And some would suggest that we're already in the early stages of conflict, right? What, hybrid warfare, you know, are we, you know, what is, when is cyber versus kinetic sorts of conflicts, when, when does that mean that, that a conflict has occurred or is occurring? All of those things mean that we need to be 
be prepared at a moment's notice. And the second piece of that, besides the hiring piece of that, is the supply chain piece of that. So I'm going to put words in your mouth, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Admiral, but I think we're probably on the same sheet of music here, that even if we had the people, that if I haven't given the indications and warning, the tipping and queuing, if you will, to the supply chain to buy advanced, you know, to advance purchase the materials to do the work, having the people doesn't really get us the readiness and co capability that we think we, you know, that we we uh, expect or what the nation expects from us. So I would say that our, our challenges are similar, but it's it's probably more a function of a system designed for optimal efficiency based on uh, many many decades at war and challenges with funding. Uh, so it's more about efficiency than it probably is about effectiveness. Yeah. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you, uh, General. And I have one uh, question for you, Admiral uh, Peters. Earlier this year, the Navy delivered a comprehensive plan for investing in the modernization of its shipyards. For the fleet readiness centers and air logistics complexes, do you have similar comprehensive plans to invest in the infrastructure and the capital equipment not just to support new weapon systems, but to also sustain the legacy platforms. And can you describe some of these initiatives and budget requirements? And I don't have much time left, so. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just briefly, uh, we are behind uh, NAFC in this, and we're going to follow their lead and what they've done with the shipboard optimization plan. Uh, so just last week, I, I mentioned that I've been on the job two weeks, but just last week I uh, ordered the um, baselining of all of our depot uh, equipment, that 71,000 pieces of equipment, starting with the first 800 critical items that uh, the production line stop if that equipment doesn't work. So we're going to start this year with the baselining, and then the, the following year we'll put the modernization plan in place. Thank you. And uh, General, can you also? Y yes, ma'am. So we do have a comprehensive plan for both infrastructure and capital investment. And of course, as you know, we by law invest 6% of of our uh, earnings every year back into uh, into the infrastructure, if you will. So we put that both into the physical infrastructure and in the plant property and equipment. Good example would be F-22 uh, robotic coating. We now do that. We don't expose workers to that hazard. We go faster and we do it cheaper. Uh, and there are a variety of additional examples. We do it also in the facilities. But the one thing I would tell you is that our 6% depot investment uh, language does not allow us to buy Milcon with that. We st and so I would suggest that in, in ways of thinking about how do we go faster, and by going faster I go cheaper and deliver more readiness, I think that's an additional area that we should collectively explore. That's, that's a very good point. And my time is up, so I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Badaya, Congressman Austin Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gen General Levy, I want to go back to the data issue. and. Uh, if you could share your insights into the need for the services to uh, own or obtain data rights and, and specifically how the link that links to uh, additive manufacturing. And then one of the questions in regard to that is, is it possible to, for the data to be both uh, secure as we know it has to be secure, but we also at the depots we need it to be on demand. And so how do you balance that security with uh, on-demand access to it. So, sir, I'm going to answer that question first and then go kind of go back to the data rights piece. Uh, whenever we think about doing something like this, we think about it not from a just a technical perspective. We think about it from a cybersecurity perspective because ultimately what I want to do is I don't want to print this at one of my air logistics complexes. I want to send these ones and zeros downrange to Guam where I've got continuous bomber presence and I want my folks to be able to print it out right there. And so when we develop our technical data packages, we do it in a way such that we can ensure cybersecurity and the cyber pedigree. So if I send you those ones and zeros downrange, you know and I know that the ones and zeros I sent you are the ones and zeros you got. So when you print this out, you'll know it's exactly what you expected it to be. And so that's an absolutely, it's a non-negotiable requirement of how we do this business. And I would suggest to you, because some have criticized the department for its slow pace of adopting additive manufacturing, that that's, a, that's an area where there's risk, and so it's an area where we've proceeded with caution to make sure we get it right. Uh, this, is, this is not uh, it's not an area where we need to be arbitrary or capricious. With respect to intellectual property, what I would say is that we need better laws with respect to intellectual property. Intellectual property is the ink in an inkjet printer. You can get an inkjet printer generally for not a whole lot of money. 
but you're going to have to buy the ink year over year over year. And I don't know that necessarily we as the DOD understand that as we migrate to an information age department from a iron age department. And so our, our procurement laws, our procurement strategies, I don't think have adapted. And when we say intellectual property, some people, I think, believe that it's an all or nothing proposition. Most of the time, at least in my universe, we don't want all of the intellectual property to sell it on the open market or compete it. What we really want is enough of the intellectual property and the data rights so we can take care of what the nation has asked us to take care of. And quite frankly, a lot of companies lose interest in taking care of some of these weapon systems over time. Dean worries about the E-6, our only airborne nuclear command and control platform. Lives at Tinker, is sustained at Tinker, but it's in his portfolio. We collectively worry about companies who may not want to take care of that anymore. B-52, KC-135, B-1, we could go on and on, but you get, you get the message. And so having that intellectual property gives us the ability to do these kinds of things without, without having to reverse engineer it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, Admirals, I've heard uh, Secretary Wilson speak about this uh, repeatedly and uh, better contracting and, and owning our uh, data when we, when we pay to develop a system. Is the Navy uh, pursuing this as well with the contracting? Is, is, I haven't heard as much from the Navy about it as I've heard from the Air Force. Yes, sir. Uh, let me mention that just having finished a tour as a program executive officer, I can tell you that uh, technical data rights are a, a source of friction between the government and industry, and it, it seems to be getting worse. I think what we need to be careful of is that we don't overreach, and that's I think, has driven industry back into their corner a little bit and put up the, uh, the barriers. So we absolutely need that those critical pieces for from a sustainment standpoint, but we want we don't want to reach into their intellectual property. I think that's when when we're going to bring the lawyers out if we're not careful. I, I would suggest to you that when 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 the United States taxpayer pays for the development of a system, we've paid for the development of the data, and and that issue needs to be handled up front. Uh, our, our defense industrial complex is extremely important to our national security, um, and and they deserve a square deal. Uh, but the United States taxpayers uh, deserve a square deal as well. And if it takes um, bringing out the lawyers to, to straighten this out, then, then that's just what it's going to take. Uh, but, but, it, but I cannot imagine anybody in private business paying to develop a system and then turning around and, and not being able to um, service that system because the person you paid to develop it says, no, you don't own the system. I actually, I actually own, own what it takes to operate it. it, it it's the key to the engine of the, of the boat. Uh, with that, I yield the remainder of my time. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Congressman Scott. We now proceed to Congressman Steve Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for being willing to take a, a second round of questions. Uh, and Admiral Moore, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was out uh, looking at the great capacity of our shipyards. Uh, in San Diego. And uh, I was surprised uh, to learn uh, from the partners that are out there, uh, NASCO, BAE, others, uh, they, they do such fantastic work out there and it's a, a vital national asset. Uh, but I was surprised to learn from them there was an idle uh, dock, um, dry dock. And, you know, I'm sure that there's reasons for that. Uh, they seemed a bit puzzled on why that dock would be sitting idle and couldn't be jumped uh, with ships that were in waiting. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, I realize deployments or extensions sometimes uh, do that. Could you speak a little bit to that? Because you know, we have very limited capacity uh, with full service shipyards like San Diego. How do you address those challenges when, when you have an extension of a deployment and you've got a schedule and yet you've, you've got an empty dock and there's not that many of those? Uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, absolutely, we have, you know, the dry dock capacity that we have today is about, it doesn't have a lot of extra uh, surge in it. So, we, we ought to be making use of every dry dock we have. There's a, there's a graving dock in San Diego that the government owns that uh, you know, there's money on the unfunded priority list that we're looking for this year in 19 to go upgrade that dry dock. I think that would be good. In this particular case, I think what BA and NASCO is referring to is, you know, a floating dry dock that they own. Uh, the maintenance schedules themselves are cyclic, and so sometimes, you know, we have periods of time where we just don't have a requirement to use the dry dock. That's going to change going forward, uh, you know, as we grow the size of the Navy, 
Uh, the littoral combat ships uh, have additional docking requirements associated with it. So while there may have been a dry dock empty in, in San Diego right now, that's, that's generally not the case, and we're generally in, in a situation where we're looking to find more capacity than less. So I, I certainly uh, agree with you up front that, uh, you know, the BAAs and the NASCOs of the world, our private sector partners in, in the industrial-based management are, are absolutely critical to our ability to get that done. So where, the, where we're not using that capacity, we need to look to do that. Yeah, but thank you, and I, and I appreciate that, and I know you all are sensitive to that. Uh, yeah, it just if there's any way you know, that we could help, because I know sometimes between uh, you know, the, the, the base shipyards and then you know, the contracted shipyard or uh, uh, dock capacity, and we, we certainly don't want anything to be sitting idle. Uh, General Levy, um, commercial industry has developed quick depot turnaround times for the airline industry. Are there ways to leverage industrial practices to improve similar turnarounds? Now, I know we've talked about data, and I agree wholeheartedly with all of that. We've, we've got to come up with some legislation to help and, and future procurement. But with regard to the other things, you know, the best practices uh, on, on depot level turnaround, how, how can we leverage some of those best practices? So, sir, you'd be, I think, happy to know that we have a robust engagement with the commercial aviation industry. They actually come and learn from us, and we learn from them. In fact, uh, about six weeks ago, the president of Delta Tech Ops uh, was at my headquarters in, at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. It's the first time he'd been there, and uh, some of his other people had been over the years, and it's the first time he'd been there, and he said, wow, you guys do this better than we do. And, we, and in, specifically, he was talking about jet engine repair. Uh, because that's the jet engine center of excellence for our Air Force. So we, and we send people to the, to the commercial industry to leverage best practices. So there's a lot of back and forth dialogue by, by which we can either adopt their technologies and or their management practices. But I would say we're very competitive, very competitive. And, and I'm, on any day, I'll put my folks up against the commercial industry. I think where we have some challenges, though, are some of the, the, the laws and rules about how we fund our organic facilities. For example, a commercial airline would never bring an airplane in for overhaul unless it had all the parts and then some that it thought it might need, because that airplane and not carrying passengers is not making money. And so they're willing to take a little risk on spare parts, if you will, to have them sitting there waiting when the airplane comes in. We're subject to the bona fide need rule, hmm. which then limits us in terms of how much we can sort of lean into it. I run, a, although I run a $16 billion a year p and I'm still constrained by some of these laws and policies. Frankly, I would take a little bit of financial risk and I would bring some parts on board and have them sitting there waiting when the airplane showed up. And even if I didn't sell them today or use them today, I might use them on the next, next plane or the plane after that. But I have to be careful because I either violate the bona fide need rule or the GAO comes in and tells me that I've got too many parts sitting around and then I'm forced to divest them and buy them again later and then <clears throat> Congress tells me I'm irresponsible with funding. So there are some things there that I think we could do through policy and law that would allow us collectively to accelerate the velocity by which we bring things in, get them serviced, and back out in the hands of the warfighters. Right, thank you. Now you'll back my time. And thank you, Congressman Retzel. We now proceed to Chairman Mike Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on my last question with the other two witnesses about critical skills that you're concerned about us losing in the industrial base other than the high-tech workforce. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, you know, we tend to focus today, and, and the young kids coming in on the STEM world, and they all want to be IT, software. Uh, John, I just want to go back to something General Levy mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do in the depots, and particularly in ship repair, it's blue collar work, and I think we've lost some of that tradition of uh, in the shipyards. I, I've you know been around shipyards uh, most of my naval career, and there's a proud tradition of second and third generation folks that are in the yard. So, you know what I worry about is not just the IT folks and the people that are doing software, but I need pipe fitters, I need electricians, um, you know I need welders, and uh, you know that that's a trade that that is a that uh, you know, you're doing great work as a, as a, in that particular field. And I think we need to be encouraging the work, the young kids today, that not everybody has to be a software engineer, not everybody has to be white collar, that there is a real national need for these. And that hands-on mechanic that can do things that uh, as an artisan that nobody else can do is, is really a challenge in the shipyards. And I, I, I have more challenge finding those qualified folks sometimes than I do you know, the, the other end of the spectrum. 
It, it is a challenge, and, and it goes back to this aging workforce issue, too, because you're correct. There's an art to some of this. Uh, we, in, in my uh, jurisdiction, in my committee, we have uh, the nuclear weapon systems, and we have people working at places like Pantex in Texas that have, they've developed an art as to how to do, work on these nuclear weapons that when they retire, we don't know how we're going to replace them. Uh, it's just a, it's a real critical skill that, that we're, we're, we're confronting, and we don't know what, how, what the answer is. But what about you, General? So thank you, sir. I, I would offer, first of all, it's a national conversation about, the, about what we value from our young men and women. And rarely do we hear a national conversation about, hey, go to, go to a trade school and learn how to do these, some of these skill sets that we're talking about. It's go to, go to college, get a degree, et cetera. And so part of this is about what do we value as a nation, and by extension, what do we tell our young men and women? If you've ever tried to get your house repaired, a plumber to come to your house, get your car fixed, any one of these thousands of things, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These skill sets that we have in our portfolios are exquisite, and they're very rare. And they're essential to the national defense. Uh, I would invite you to come out to Hill Air Force Base, and you talk about nuclear weapons. I sustain two-thirds of the nuclear triad in my command. Come out to Hill Air Force Base and watch those people perform uh, maintenance on an ICBM rocket motor and slice it in half for uh, aging surveillance testing. Or watch them do the work on a transporter erector launcher that actually puts the ICBM down in the hole. And you'll see that that is incredibly skilled work, but it doesn't require a four-year degree. And as Admiral Moore said, that workforce is starting to age, and we have a very difficult time recruiting them. Lay on top of it some of the, the human capital system things that we have, and lay on top of that an economy where there's fairly low unemployment. And what you have is a building case for a significant problem that we don't want to find ourselves in. Yeah. Well, we, ha we have a challenge as a nation to try to, to uh, do a better job of communicating to our young people and, and their parents that not everybody needs a four-year degree. I'm, I've got a liberal arts education. I don't have anything against it. But the fact is a lot of these kids go to a four-year school and get a, a bachelor's degree, and they, they're lucky if they can get a job paying thirty dollars or $40,000 a year, whereas if they had gone to a two-year community college and got a, a, tra a trade skill, welding, whatever, they can start off making a lot more than that and have potential to make a lot more. Uh, and there are more job opportunities. But there's a stigma that we've got to get away from uh, that shouldn't be there, that, that that's not a good path to pursue. So I'm interested in how you f uh, confront that. Uh, I know my lo I have an Anderson Army Depot in my district, and one of the things they've done is they set up a training program where the high schools will send people to come there to, to learn how to be a welder or whatever, and they're guaranteed a job in the depot if they go through that program. And they have really dealt with a lot of their shortfalls as far as critical skills through that program. We, we have very similar uh, programs across my command. The, the challenge really is young men, and women, young men and women who want to go into that, and uh, there's just not enough of them. And in the aerospace industry in particular, as the, as the economy recovers and the domestic airlines recover and the international airlines recover, there's a, there's a large demand signal pulling those people away from government service to those other parts of the industry. Uh, and so whether you're a jet engine mechanic or, or something else, it, it's very difficult to the, find and keep them. And that's, sir, that is art. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I mean, and if you've ever seen a, a pipe fitter or somebody fix a bracket on a B-52 or an F-16, that is art. It's, a, it's an exquisite piece of craftsmanship that is the underappreciated key to our combat capability in the nation. Well, that, that's my point. The, the private sector is facing the same challenge y'all are facing, is too many kids are going to college instead of get, getting these uh, trade skills. And we've got to find a way to, to help educate young people that this is a path they ought to be considering. I'm sorry, I go over time. Uh, thank you for your service and thank you for being here. I yield back. And uh, Chairman Rogers, thank you. And what an uh, excellent point you're making. I uh, will now proceed to Congressman Mike Gallagher, a, a very appreciated veteran himself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to commend you on what I think is a, one of the most productive hearings we've had. This has been a great conversation on a topic that I tend to think is probably the most important one that no one's really paying attention to. Um, but perhaps this suggests that we could get more attention paid to it. And I'd just like to go back to the issue of surge capacity, which we uh, talked about briefly, and maybe start with you, General Levy, just how do I put this? I mean, maybe in your opinion, what has changed when it comes to the 
defense industrial base from the days of Freedom's Forge to the present? What, what vulnerabilities have sort of crept into the base that didn't exist back then that would complicate our ability to surge? Thank you, sir. First thing I would tell you is um, years of, of budgetary uncertainty and budgetary pressure, mm -hmm. right? And so that becomes a bit of a corrosive effect over time. You've heard our service chiefs and secretaries talk about the corrosive nature of sequestration, and we typically think about that in our, in our uniform force, but this is the foundation upon which our, our combat readiness rides for all of us, right? If we get this wrong, it doesn't matter how many men and women we have in uniform mm -hmm. because we won't be able to project power. The second piece of that is somewhere along the way, we lost, first of all, we're not as an industrialized nation. Our economy has shifted. That's another component to it. The economy has globalized, and I don't, and while we realize that from an economic perspective, I don't know that necessarily from a, from a defense sustainment perspective, we've, we've necessarily caught up with that. And then we've, we've really migrated towards efficiency over combat effectiveness or, or effectiveness in in many of our structures. And then lastly, I, I would offer that perhaps we, do, we fail to appreciate how much of the supply chain is globalized in terms of the materials it takes to make modern weapon systems. And so when you put all of those things into the recipe, I think that's, that's what's caused us to perhaps lose some of our, our focus. And then lastly, and I see this occasionally in the department, the concept that logistics and sustainment is a cost center. In fact, if you read some of the literature occasionally, you'll say, well, we gotta cut the cost of logistics and sustainment. Oh, okay, that's true, but the implication is that if I cut the cost, I'll still get the same readiness, but I just won't spend as much money. I would offer that logistics and sustainment is a combat effect. Mm -hmm. If you get it right, you can, you can impose your will on the enemy. If we get it wrong, the enemy will impose his will on us. I appreciate that, and I, I pose the same question to the Navy, but perhaps maybe touch, if you would, on sort of the, demi the decline of commercial shipbuilding and how that relates to naval shipbuilding as well. Uh, I, I was going to touch on that exactly. I think we, we still have, we somewhat have this nostalgic view that, uh, you know, World War II happened, Pearl Harbor happened, and, and in two months we were <laughs> ramped up the machine. If you go read the book, that's not the case. It took us years, even back then, and that's with unemployment at 16% in a, in a nation that was hungry for jobs. So today you're gonna have that challenge. Uh, one of the things that has changed over the years is uh, the number of private yards that build ships for us today has significantly gone down over the last uh, you know, 20 to 25 years. We were at 17 or 18 yards that could build naval ships for us now, and we're down to probably, I don't know the exact number, but probably five or six core yards. And the same thing goes uh, for commercial shipbuilding. Most of that's been you know, is overseas, uh, you know, most of the commercial shipbuilding now, other, other than the things that, uh, you know, why we have to follow by law, that, that's done overseas. That, that's going to be a real challenge for us. And then getting back to the conversation we just had with, with, uh, with uh, Representative Rogers is, you know, the, the workforce today, go, where are you going to go find the people that have kind of those blue-collar artisan skills is really going to be a challenge. So I think the, the combination that... Uh, you know, the industrial base as it exists today looks completely different than it did uh, 50, 60 years ago. A lot of that work is done overseas. Uh, the work also on the platforms is a lot more complicated. We're not talking about building Liberty ships in 90 days. We're talking about warships that are a, a lot more complicated. So there's a, there's a number of things here that are going to complicate the problem for us. I will say, though, that the American worker and the American people, you know, when, it, when the challenges arise and have always risen to the challenge in the past, I have no doubt that we would do that going forward. Sure. No, real, nothing really to add other than that uh, if you look at it from a constraints standpoint, I, I think we have uh, the, the tooling that we need to surge, but it's those other aspects. Can we hire the, the, the people to do the work and can we uh, get the supply chain predictive enough? I appreciate that. I'm running out of time. And I just would say, I think particularly as the, the Pentagon finalizes uh, its response to the White House uh, directive on a review of the industrial base, it might be useful for Congress, I, I think, to do something similar, a parallel effort in a sort of systematic way, both to analyze that report and also kind of do our own analysis of the industrial base kind of as a follow-on to this hearing. So thank you for getting that conversation started with us today. And thank you, Congressman Mike Gallagher, and thank each of you as witnesses today. This, uh, I, I agree with the uh, member from uh, Wisconsin, Congressman Gallagher. This has been a very helpful hearing, and I just appreciate uh, everyone being here and 
the uh, participation record participation by um, members who are really dedicated to work with you on behalf of the American military. I also want to thank uh, Drew Warren for his service. Uh, and with this, we are adjourned.